want to apologize. Maybe somebody is saying, I think I heard that sermon a little while ago. Um, sometimes when we do tapes and I send them out to people, they will send back to me and say, we couldn't hear it or it didn't come out well. So I went back and I checked the uh, tape that we did on Daniel 11 and it um, didn't turn out very well. So a lot of people in different places around the world wanted to hear this because you just don't hear it very often. So that's why we're going to repeat it this morning. So I apologize, but I think, you know, as, as whenever we open the Bible and study, especially on something that we don't see very often, uh, it never hurts to hear it twice. I'll be honest with you folks, um, coming from the concrete jungle of San Jose, California, um, with a mindset that was just immersed in worldly things as, as mine was. Um, you know, to study Bible subjects, to study prophecy. I remember when I first started reading the book of Daniel, I remember closing it in disgust and saying, this, this is a joke. What is this doing in the Bible about animals with horns and, and four wings? I said, this is ridiculous. And I threw my Bible in disgust across my bed, I, I literally, um, and, uh, but for me to, to understand these things, um, I have to go over them over and over and over again, and, uh, and that's what I've done. So we're going to go over Daniel 11, the first 39 verses again this morning, but before we do, let's pray. Loving Father, thank you. Thank you for your word that's a force that just doesn't change. Thank you that as things swirl and, and we feel like we're in a, a whirling motion, like we're in a washing machine, thank you that your word hasn't changed. Thank you that we can be still this morning and know that you are still God and you're still on your throne and that we can trust you. We pray for the Holy Spirit to rest upon us this morning as we study together and to strengthen us, to strengthen each one of us right where we are. In Christ's name I pray, amen. You know, as we get started in Daniel 11, <laughs> I want to go to a different Bible passage because, you know, I think the core, the sum and substance of the books of Daniel and Revelation that Ellen White says, if we will understand these, there will be a revival among us. The core issue in Daniel and Revelation is not beasts and animals and the Antichrist, but it's... It's righteousness by faith. And I think in the books of Daniel and Revelation, we see it most graphically because we see nations, and we're going to see them this morning. These nations come on the scene of Earth's history, and they look so powerful, and they look unstoppable, and all of a sudden they disappear. Like Babylon. You know, it was the golden kingdom for a long time. But now it's no more. It's, it's gone. It, it's it's no, not in existence. Why? Because Babylon was going to do it Babylon's way. And Babylon was in it for their glory and not the glory of Christ. So we, we see these nations that, that have come on the stage of earth's history and they collapse because they don't trust in the power of God 
but rather trust in their own strength. And that folk is the sum and substance of these two books of Daniel and Revelation. And so I want to start this morning with a gentleman in Philippians chapter 3 by the name of the Apostle Paul who learned a lesson that all of the nations of earth's history have failed to understand and which the United States is failing to understand as well. Philippians chapter 3, starting with verse 3, Paul said, For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. So the focus, as Paul's bringing out here, those who are of the circumcision are those who are looking to Christ and not to themselves. Uh, and as Paul said, have no confidence in the flesh. And Paul goes on, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I am more. So Paul said, if, if you're tempted to trust in your own flesh and to think that in your own strength you can perform something good, well, Paul says, I've got one up on you. Verse 5, he was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee. Now that's an interesting term, as touching the law of Pharisee. How did the Pharisees touch the law of God? They touched it, but how far did they go in touching the law? How, did, how far did they go? Somebody help me. I'm, I'm a little bit slow this morning, so you help me. How did they touch the law as a Pharisee? How did they do that? What's that, Cody? The oral law. What do you mean by that, Cody? Okay. Okay. Let's jump on one word there, Cody. Legalistic. How how did the Jews, how did Paul as a Pharisee, he touched the law legalistically? How did he do that? How did Paul do that? Anybody? How did he do that? See, now you're going to have to help me, folks, because I'm just, you know, didn't sleep that well last night, so my mind's just running a little bit behind. So you guys are going to have to pick me up. <laughs> okay, Pharisees claim to interpret the law over other people. How far, how far did a Pharisee allow the law of God to touch them? Did it go right inside to what we think about in our brain and what the motive is behind why we do something? Did a Pharisee allow the law to actually meet the mind? Or did the Pharisee use the law only as far as it pertained to outward acts? That's how they did it, Nellie. They used it so... They could, now think about this, folk. On a Friday afternoon, the Pharisees came together and they nailed the greatest man who ever lived. They killed him because there was anger and there was vindictiveness and hatred in their minds. And right after they did that, what did they go home and do? They prepared for the Sabbath. <laughs> no. They got ready for the Sabbath. So the law never came inside here. It, they only allowed the law to touch 
their outward acts, but it never had anything to do with anger or immoral thoughts or being unkind or to be contemplating, how can I let this guy have it? See, they, they never allowed the law to touch their mind. Okay, Nelly, they used it. Um, say that again, Nelly. They interpreted the law in a way that would only benefit them. Okay, they interpreted the law only in a way that would benefit them. It was all about me. It was all about me. They did. The Pharisees did consider themselves to be the absolute authority and the law. They did. And that's why they could kill the Son of God. They could kill him. Paul? Okay. Matthew 15. Okay. Okay. All right, it was, it was their religion, it was their law, everything was about them. That's a great point. And you know, folk, in the final analysis over the issue of Sabbath and Sunday, Sabbath is about saying, Lord, in my life, it's about you. And Sunday is simply saying, Lord, in my life, it's all about me. That's the essence of Sabbath and Sunday right there. Absolutely, Nelly. Absolutely. No change, but I'm still Lord with you. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's go on. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Paul was a great persecutor. Isn't that interesting? I thought Paul was a part of the church, wasn't he? He was a part of the church, wasn't he? But he said, I was persecuting the church. So the church, obviously, in Paul's mind, it wasn't an organization because he was part of an organization, wasn't he? He was part of that great religious organization called Judaism. But Paul says... Even though I was in that, I was persecuting the church. So who was the church then? It was those who were faithfully following Christ, wasn't it? That's an interesting comment he makes there. He says he persecuted the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. As far as outward acts, Paul touched the law, and considered himself perfect and blameless. But then when the law actually hit his mind and he saw what he was inside, verse 7 says, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. All those outward acts of, of obedience, Paul says they weren't worth anything because I realized my motives and my thoughts were all wrong. Obedience to man's law. Sure, Nelly. Sure. Verse 8, Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. So Paul says, what matters is what's going on in my head and, and who I'm allowing to be in charge of my thoughts and my mind. And he says, everything else, it's refuse, it's, it's, it's dung. And verse 9, he says, and be found in him not having my own righteousness which was outward obedience to, to certain things, 
He said, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. You know, folk, as we look at Scripture, there's two things that are identified as righteousness. Do you know what they are? There's two things in the Bible that are identified as righteousness. What are they? Can you think of one thing? In the Bible, where the Bible says, this is righteousness, or he is righteousness. The Lord, okay? Jeremiah 23, verse 6 says, the Lord our righteousness. So Christ is righteousness. What is the other thing in the Bible that's referred to as righteous? Do you know what it is? Okay, David said it in Psalm 119. Psalm 119, okay, good try, Nellie. Let's notice, Psalm 119, verse 172. Psalm 119, 172. Notice what the Bible says. It says, my tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are what? Righteousness. So there's two things in the Bible that are called righteousness. The Lord Jesus Christ is righteousness, and the law of God is righteousness. Now the great question is, is if the standard of righteousness is God's law, and that's righteousness, how do we reach there? How do we reach to that standard of righteousness? which is ultimately, folk, what the great controversy is about that goes on in your mind and in my mind every day of the week. How do I attain to the holiness of that law, which is righteousness? How do I get there? But how do I do that, Nelly? I can't keep that because... Absolutely. Absolutely. See, folk, in... Romans chapter 10, Paul says that the Jews were ignorant of God's righteousness and went about to establish their own. So the law is there, and so the Jews said, I'm just going to let that law apply to my outward behavior, and then I can, I can obey that law, which is an impossibility. It's an impossibility. Because a sinful heart cannot keep purity. That's, that's not possible. But then Paul says in Romans 10, 4, he says, but Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Our evangelical friends will say, the law just left because Paul said Christ is the end of the law. So the, the law is gone. That's not what Paul's saying. Paul is saying there's two ways that people try to attain obedience to that law. One is through their own efforts, which the Jews tried and failed miserably. The other way is through faith in the power of Christ to lift us, to empower us to keep God's Ten Commandments. And so when Paul says in Romans 10, 4, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes, Paul says, trying to do it ourselves, it's not going to work. But through Christ and his power, he can lift us to keep God's commands. Now, folk, Every kingdom that we're going to look at this morning in Daniel chapter 11 has chosen to try to obey and do right by themselves. And they failed miserably. And America is failing miserably, isn't it? America is just coming apart at the seams because it is refusing to be in submission to Jesus Christ. And of course, the ultimate attempt by America to try to save themselves in rebellion against God, 
will be a Sunday law. And we see that right on the horizon, right on the horizon. Well, the first couple of kingdoms we're going to look at this morning in Daniel 11 that, that failed miserably, the Medes, the Medes and Persians, duplicating what we've already seen in Daniel 2, Daniel 7, and Daniel 8 with a slight variation because we don't see Babylon here in Daniel 11, verse 4, because Babylon's off the scene of verse history. But verses 1 through 4, it says, In the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. Now will I show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia. The fourth shall be far richer than they all. By his strength through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. So, folk, here we, we have a repetition. What we've already seen in Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, we see it again in Daniel 11. The Medes and Persians start off, then we have mention of Greece. A mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. Who was the mighty king? Alexander the Great. So again, repetition from what we've already seen. When he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken, shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven, not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion which he ruled. His kingdom shall be plucked up even for others besides those. So again, folk, we have kingdoms. Medo-Persia, Greece, Alexander the Great. We can throw in... Presidents, we can throw in Barack Obama, we can throw in Donald Trump. People making efforts to do things independent of the power of God, and they will come down. Hillary Clinton, same thing. Now, it said there, there would be three kings that would stand up in Persia. The fourth would be richer than all of them. Well, that's exactly what happened. Cambyses came into power in 530 to 522 B.C. Then there was a man named the false Smyrdas who usurped the kingdom for just a short time in 522. Then Darius I, this was a very common name in uh, the land of Media Persia. Kind of like for Muslims, Mohammed's a very common name. In America, John, very common Darius was a very common name in Media Persia. The fourth king that would follow in the train of Daniel 11 was a Hashueris. A Hashueris was the husband of Esther. And a Hashueris, according to history, was the most wealthy of all the Medo Persian kings had more wealth than all the rest of them. Ahasuerus was the father of the famous Artaxerxes. That's right, Nellie. Ahasuerus was the father of Artaxerxes, the one who set up the uh, third and final decree in 457 B.C., but Ahasuerus was the most wealthy of all the kings. He ruled from 485 to 465. He sought to wipe out the Greeks around 480, 479 in some famous battles, uh, Plataea, Marathon, and so on. Then Greece rises, just as the Bible says. A mighty Greek king rises after Medo-Persia falls. Clearly, it's Alexander. Daniel 11.4 describes the divisions of his empire among his four leading generals, Cassander, Lysimachus, Seleucids, and Ptolemy. Now, folk, if you look at this, this becomes central and very important as we seek to understand Daniel 11 because Alexander's kingdom was divided among his four leading generals. Now, he actually had about 32 to 40 leading generals. But these four emerged 
out of those 40-odd generals. Cassander took Greece, this area of the Western Mediterranean. This is the Mediterranean world right here. Rome is right over here. Lysimachus took this area we know of as Asia Minor, where all the seven churches where Paul preached, Galatia's in here, and so on. Seleucius was the third general. He took this area and all the area to the east. This, now, this would be Syria, number one. And then he took Babylon. He took Medo-Persia. He took India. So Seleucius took all the area to the east that Alexander had conquered. Okay? Good question. Now, what's this little strip of land called right here? What's this? Somebody tell me. What is it? Israel, Maria. That's exactly right. This is Israel. And then down here, south of Israel, this is Egypt. And Ptolemy was the general of Alexander that took Egypt. Now, throughout Daniel chapter 11, it refers to two of those kingdoms. One is called the king of the north. The other is called the king of the south. Now, which ones of these are the king of the north and the king of the south? Somebody said it. Hilda, I think you said it. What did you say? Why do you say that, Hilda? You're absolutely right. Hilda said that Seleucius is the king of the north. Why do you think it's the, he's the king of the north? Hilda, why do you think? <laughs> What's that, Nelly? Because of the territory he had accumulated? Okay, but, but why the designation of north and south? Why would we say, as Hilda did, and she was correct, Seleucius is the king of the north, but why? Why is that the king of the north? Cody? It's directly north of Israel. And everything, as Gabriel is telling Daniel the outline of history in Daniel 11, it's all in relationship to God's people because God's people are the most, that's where the focus is, and that's what Daniel was most concerned about. So the king of the north, the one that's due north of Israel, Seleucius. Now who would the king of the south be? Ptolemy. Ptolemy's Egypt. And the reason why it's the king of the south? Because it's south of Israel. Cody? Also, it's the Seleucid and the Ptolemies, those are the only two uh, regions that ever had a struggle over the land that the Lysimachus and Cassander never got involved in. So those are the only two ones that are fighting over that land and they just gained and lost ground. Very good, Cody. Of all the four divisions of Alexander's empire, it was the Seleucids in the north and the Ptolemies in the south. They were constantly going back and forth through the land of Israel trying to defeat the other one. Constantly. And their great focus was this strip of land. They wanted to control Israel. Lysimachus, Cassander never had anything to do with Israel at all. Great point, Cody. Great point. Daniel 11 is following a similar pattern as did Daniel 2, 7, and 8. The preceding chapters with slight variations covers the three kingdoms of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and its four divisions. Pagan, papal Rome, and then the deliverance of God's people. This is repeated in greater detail here in Daniel 11. 
folk. Why this becomes important, so important to us, is that no matter what happens in this world, no matter how bad it may get in this world, in all of these chapters, what comes at the end is always the deliverance of, of us. That's what always comes. And so the message of Daniel again and again and again is, no matter what goes on in this world, God is going to win and he's going to bring his captives home. That's the message in Daniel, folks. So, see, we can see all of this. History tells us Babylon rose, Medo-Persia rose, Greece rose, pagan and papal Rome rose. But this is the last part we don't know about yet. But Daniel says, hold on. Keep, keep holding on to Christ by faith because you're going to win. You're going to win. Nellie, you could say that. But see, Genesis through Revelation, Nellie, Except in the book of Daniel and in Revelation, no other, no other Bible book, Nellie, lays out history like Daniel and Revelation does. And because it's so graphically portrayed in Daniel and Revelation, Nellie, then, then you can see, okay, this kingdom rose, then this, then this, but we haven't seen Christ come. But because those things happen, we know he's going to come. You see? And that is graphically portrayed, Nellie, in Daniel and Revelation. All other Bible books, the message is there, but not graphically like Daniel and Revelation. Now, Daniel 11, 5 to 15, we're not going to read all that but it discusses clashes between Seleucid's kingdom, the king of the north, which was Syria, Babylon, the land of the east, and the Ptolemaic kingdom covering Egypt called the king of the south. And that's what continually went on. We'll just notice one verse, Daniel 11, verse 6. Watch. In the end of the years, they shall join themselves together. So there was an attempt to... Uh, unite Seleucid and Ptolemy. The king's daughter of the south, that would be an Egyptian king, one of Ptolemy's descendants, shall come to the king of the north, to the Seleucid kingdom, to make an agreement. But she shall not retain the power of the arm, neither shall he stand nor his arm, but she shall be given up, and they that brought her and he that begot her, and he that strengthened her in these times. What's that? The daughter here, Nellie? The king's daughter? One of the descendants of Ptolemy. They wanted to intermarry with... It was Bernice, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but they came to the Seleucid kingdom to try to bring a, a covenant, a union of the two powers. And it didn't work. It didn't work. In fact, we see that throughout the first half of Daniel chapter 11. Again, through prophecy, the continual focus is Men are frail. Men are weak. Don't trust them. Uh, that's, that's the message. Testimonies to Ministers, page 112, it says, the Holy Spirit has so shaped matters in the giving of prophecy and in the events portrayed as to teach that the human agent is to be kept out of sight, hid in Christ, and that the Lord God of heaven and his law are to be exalted. Think, friends, for a minute this morning. How many people who we would say 
Oh, they, they were great. Let's think of a few people. How about John Harvey Kellogg? Was he a great physician? Folk, there were presidents. Presidents. Um, Henry Ford, the great car magnet. They went to Battle Creek, Michigan to be treated by John Harvey Kellogg. There were great, famous, famous people that came from all over the world to Battle Creek because of John Harvey Kellogg. What happened to John Harvey Kellogg? He did, Nellie. John Harvey Kellogg left the Adventist message, spent the last many years of his life warring against the spirit of prophecy, and from all that we can see, died a lost man. Why? He was a great man. Why did John, Why will he be lost? Because of this. The human agent is to be kept out of sight. And the Lord God of heaven and his law are to be exalted. How about the two famous Adventist ministers that preached the message of 1888? What were their names? Come on, somebody tell me. I'm a little bit slow. Who was it? Wagner and Jones. Yeah. What happened to them? What's that, Nellie? E.J. Wagoner went to England and began to believe that his office secretary was going to be his wife in heaven. And that the wife he was living with, her name was Jessie Mosier Wagoner, he believed that in heaven, he would not be married or with his wife on earth, but he was going to be married to his office secretary. Now, he called it spiritual uh, wifery or something like that. Folk, what happened to E.J. Wagoner? He lost hold of Jesus Christ he began to exalt himself. And listen, I mean, that's crazy. That's craziness. But that's what happened to E.J. Wagoner. A.T. Jones, same thing. Not, he didn't get into spiritual wifery, but he lost his way as well. So, folk, we must be kept out of sight and the Lord God of heaven and his law are alone to be exalted. Read the book of Daniel. See how Ellen White talks about the exaltation of Christ alone. The human agent should disappear, and she says, read the book of Daniel. Why? Because that's the great emphasis of that book. Call up point by point the history of the kingdoms there represented. Behold statesmen, councils, powerful armies, and see how God wrought to abase the pride of men and lay human glory in the dust. That's the message of the book of Daniel, folk. Human glory in the dust. Now, because these kingdoms are following the same train we saw in previous chapters in Daniel, the next kingdom we should start looking for, which one is it? Which one, Nellie? Pagan Rome. We've had Medo-Persia, we've had the introduction of Greece, and now we should start looking for something that identifies pagan Rome entering into history. Well, Daniel eleven sixteen to 20, it talks about some things here. Let's just read it. 
He that comes against him shall do according to his will. None shall stand before him. He shall stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. He shall set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom. Upright runs with him. Thus shall he do. He shall give him the daughter of women, corrupting her. But she shall not stand on his side, neither be for him. Now, some people have said, well, this is talking about the union of pagan Rome with the famous daughter of Ptolemy named Cleopatra. I think that's questionable. I don't think there's a lot of proof for that. But let's go on. After this shall he turn his face to the isle, shall take many, but a prince for his own behalf shall cause the reproach offered by him to cease. Without his own reproach he shall cause it to turn upon him. Then he shall turn his face toward the fort of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. Now the next verse says, Then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom. But within few days he shall be destroyed neither in anger nor in battle. Now I find that, folk, as we're looking here for something that will bring us to pagan Rome, I think this passage right here brings us to pagan Rome. Who was the most famous man who raised taxes in all of human history? What was his name? Cody, say it again. Augustus Caesar. In the time when Mary was pregnant with Jesus, Augustus, caused all the world to be taxed, right there. And it was in the glory of the pagan Rome, Roman kingdom. So I believe, folk, we have right here very marked evidence for the change from the divisions of the Greek Empire to pagan Rome. Of course, Luke chapter 2, 1 to 3 talks about that famous taxing in the time of Jesus. Luke 2 says, It came to pass in those days there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, every one to his own city. So Augustus Caesar taxed the world. All were to go and be enrolled in their own city. And so Mary and Joseph went to Bethlehem where Christ was born. So I think, folk, this is a clear reference to a transitional point now in the book of Daniel chapter 11 where now we have come to the pagan Roman Empire. Again, following the same line of, of thinking. Daniel 11 begins with Medo-Persia. And then Greece. And then pagan Rome. And at some point, as we have seen in at least Daniel 7 and 8, we will see a transition to papal Rome as well. Daniel eleven twenty one 21, and 22. I think we have another clear statement about the pagan Roman Empire. It says, In his estate, talking about Caesar Augustus, shall stand up a vile person. Tiberius was a vile person. To whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom. He shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. And with the arms of a flood shall, be, 
shall they be overflown from before him and shall be broken. Yes, also the prince of the covenant. So here we have the breaking of the prince of the covenant. Now who is this prince that the Bible's talking about that was broken by the pagan Roman Empire? Have to be Christ. Absolutely. Christ was the prince of the covenant and the Bible says he would be broken and that would be the crucifixion of Christ and Christ died in the time of Tiberius Caesar. So we clearly have references to the birth of Christ and also his death. And of course, when Jesus died, he made forever sure the covenant that God made with man from the beginning. And we see right here in Matthew 27, 24 to 26, that it was during the time of a pagan Roman governor, Pilate, that the Lamb of God was crucified. Now we go further on, Daniel 11, 28 to 32, and we see continual reference here. In fact, I've highlighted it in red about a war that went on with the holy covenant of God. Notice, Daniel 11, 28 to 32. He shall return to his land with great riches. His heart shall be against the holy covenant. So the power identified here now is making a tax on the holy covenant. Going on down at the time appointed, he shall return, come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. For the, sip, the ships of Shetam shall come against him, therefore he shall be grieved and return, and again, have indignation against the holy covenant covenant so shall he do he shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant so we've seen folks three different references here in Daniel 11 where there is a war there is a war against God's holy covenant It also says, arms shall stand on his part. They shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. So there's an attack on the sanctuary. They shall take away the daily. They shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. So four different times in these few verses... We have a war that's raging against God's covenant. Now, God's covenant, God's covenant was always built on two things. Number one, it was built on God's commandments. And number two, it was built on the power of Christ to keep them. If you notice throughout the book of Genesis and also in Exodus, whenever God made a covenant with Noah in Genesis chapter 9, with Abraham in Genesis chapter 17, and then with the children of Israel in Exodus chapter 19, God always referred to his agreement with them as my covenant. And the basis of every one of God's covenants was the Ten Commandments. That was always the basis of God's covenant was the Ten Commandments. And the Bible says that there would be a power after pagan Rome that would attack God's holy covenant or would attack 
God's Ten Commandments. So we see the rise of the papacy now being identified in Daniel chapter 11. Daniel 11, 33 to 35 goes on, describes further what the papacy would do. It says, They that understand among the people shall instruct many. They shall fall by the sword, by flame, by captivity, by spoil many days. I think we have a clear reference here to the papacy persecuting God's people. When they shall fall, they shall be holpen with a little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries. Some of them of understanding shall fall to try them to purge, to make them white even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. So we have a battle that raged. This is talking now, we're looking at the Dark Ages, when the papacy slew the people of God with sword, flame, captivity, and the spoil. Daniel 11, 36 and 37, continually here referring to the papacy. It says, he shall exalt himself, magnify himself above every god, speak marvelous things against the God of gods. That sounds just like the little horn of Daniel chapter 7 and just like the first beast of Revelation 13. They would speak blasphemous things against the God of heaven, magnifying themselves. And then, of course, down here it says, he shall magnify himself above all. Daniel 7, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, describes this same exaltation of the man of sin. Same thing. It says that the papacy would honor the God of forces. He shall honor them with gold and silver and precious stones. He shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. Praise the Lord, Daniel 11, Daniel 12, make it clear that it will not be the papacy or the king of the north ultimately that wins, it will be the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord this morning. You know, as we've studied together today, I, I just hope and pray for myself and for each one of us that it will be a, another call to trusting in the power of Christ and not in ourselves. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much today. for the warning that you've given to us in your word today, to trust in you, not in ourselves, to depend upon your strength and not on our weakness. Thank you, thank you that by faith we can look outside of our weakness and find your strength. Thank you that we can look away from our ignorance and trust in your wisdom. Thank you that we can look away from our weakness and trust in your righteousness. We give you praise today. We give you thanks for your wonderful love to us and your constant companionship. In Christ's name I pray, amen.